the music up, turn the lights down in my zone. All right, y'all. Welcome back to week two of online Canvas courses. Uh, I'm recording this on Friday, so I don't know if there's any updates uh, from the weekend that uh, you know I need to address. And if I do, I'll address that in the live chat. Um, a couple things. Uh, by this point, all of your journals should be graded. Uh, and a few guys asked about you know just what to expect on a daily basis. And so you should expect you know a reading quiz or just a you know a review quiz. Did you? watch the videos that you check out the readings for each lecture where there's not going to be a big quiz or a test. Uh, originally, at least in the first week, I was thinking we would do our test uh, the first Thursday that uh, came up, okay, so a week uh, from now, basically, uh, this Thursday, this coming Thursday, if you're watching this on Monday. And uh, I think we're just, it's going to be a weird gap if we do that, so we're going to move that test to the next Thursday, right, so that will be the Thursday um, before the Easter break and then we'll come back and we'll have a few more weeks before really uh, you guys uh, you know you're almost done so uh, your commencement luncheon uh, is May 2nd or May 1st and I don't know if that's gonna happen or not it's probably not gonna happen but uh, but you guys are done at that point so there's not a lot of time left and we're gonna try to get through a couple things here with marriage uh, what it means to be a good husband and a good father and then we'll make a transition from that into priesthood. So we have kind of like biological fatherhood within marriage and family life, and then sort of that spiritual fatherhood in the priesthood life. And so we're kind of at that like, you know, the climactic point of our course where we're going to take what we've learned in the third quarter and in this you know, first week here about discernment, and now apply that to thinking about your call either to the married life or to the priestly life. Um, and we're going to start with the married life, you know, because the assumption is that most of you guys will in fact uh, be married. And so you want to think, if I'm called to the married life, what are the things I need to think about and pray about to discern that vocation properly? And that's why we did the whole thing on preconception and knowing why you think what you think about. Because a lot of people have preconceptions about what marriage is and what it's like and whether it's for them or not. And so that's the kind of lens that we're going to explore this through is working through our preconceptions, our understandings of what married uh, married life is like so that we can better discern are we actually called to the married life and then in what capacity in what way and in what time the goal is not by the end of this uh, quarter here even online that you have discerned your vocation but rather it's the idea that we're going to give you the tools to discern that vocation uh, as you go throughout your life so today uh, I'm going to try to really keep it brief today um, we're just going to look at an introduction to this book called The Seven Myths of Marriage uh, by a couple, Jennifer and Chris Caxor. And they wrote this book, and I'm going to post chapters of it on Canvas. Um, we're not we're going to skip the chapter on this introduction because I think we can just do a video on it. You don't need to read it. Uh, but tomorrow you'll read chapter one, right? And what they did was they broke down seven different myths that people usually think of when they think about marriage. Things that, whether it's because of the common mentality, right? Remember that we talked about with preconceptions that it's just commonly believed certain things about marriage uh, that are in fact not true about marriage, or it's because of that material prejudice that we talked about, where people are so concerned with the material physical things that they miss that deeper spiritual or metaphysical uh, reality that we talked about last week with uh, belief and the access to reality through that mode, right? Um, the first chapter here is just going to be kind of a review of things you probably already heard if you had Coach Lamoth uh, in morality class, or maybe if you had Mr. Rillian. Well, you all did have Mr. Rillian. Uh, so you probably have already heard some of this stuff. Um, so again, put it on two times speed. Uh, you know, Get the video over with uh, as fast as possible if you want to uh, fast forward. But again, I think it's really important to review this um, because it's going to help make that discernment possible and more accurate if you've got some of these things in mind. So what we're going to talk about today is happiness and authentic happiness. What does it mean to be truly happy? And uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what happiness consists in. And um, I think you know during this time with the coronavirus and all this stuff, uh, people are starting to rethink what it is that actually brings them happiness and comfort. And so uh, it's maybe not a bad time for us to rethink what brings us happiness, what is happiness. The reason we're starting with happiness, though, is that the assumption, at least the assumption that I'm making, is that if you're called to the married life, the kind of marriage that you want to pursue is a good and happy marriage, 
right? You probably don't want to pursue a marriage that you're constantly fighting with your spouse that it's going to end in divorce or worse, you know, some sort of abuse or uh, cheating or something like that, right? No one sets out to pursue that kind of marriage. Uh, I posted in Canvas uh, a link to Michael Scott uh, doing mediation with, uh, do you want to pursue a win-lose uh, mediation or do you want to pursue a win-win mediation or a win-win-win where we all win, including me, you know, that, that would be the idea, right? I think everyone wants to pursue a marriage that is, in fact, good and happy, right? Um, but not a lot of people think that there's reasons that good marriages happen. They think they just, they just happen. If you find the right person to marry, things just work out. And so the reason that we start a lesson on marriage with a lesson on happiness is to remind ourselves that the right type of happiness or the, the best kind of happiness doesn't just happen. In fact, it, you have to work quite hard at it. And so we want to rethink maybe what are our thoughts about marriage. Um, this is a picture here of um, Ampleforth Abbey in the north of England, and it's just a place that when I went to it, you know, it gave me a lot of comfort that this building is still standing. It was built in eight, the year 800 uh, by some monks who were not masons. They just started pursuing how to build uh, an abbey for themselves, and it's still standing to this day. Uh, when I went with Jesuit in Tampa, we actually got kicked out because we were praying in the ruins of this abbey, and now it's a national park, and they didn't want us to be praying in a public space. So it was kind of funny. We got kicked out of the abbey for doing the very thing it was built uh, for. Uh, but it's pretty cool, uh, and it's and it shows kind of like yes, these abbeys are in ruins now. They've they've you know the, the monks have since left, uh, but there's something about even in these ruins, there's this joy that was there that. These people, you know, in the year 800, came together to build this beautiful abbey to praise and worship God. And it was a source of great comfort for me, even though it's ruinous now. It serves no material function now, right? Um, and I think that gets to the heart of what, uh, right? So I hope it gets to the heart of what we're going to try to explore today, which is sometimes we take the wrong view and say, whatever's going to bring me material comfort, whatever's going to be most efficient, is what's going to bring me the most happiness when sometimes it's the non-efficient things like this ruin of an abbey that actually bring the most uh, joy. And so uh, what Jennifer and Chris Cox were saying in the first chapter here is that without a sound understanding of what happiness is, a person's going to be frustrated in finding happiness whether they're married or not, right? Like you need to know what kind of happiness you're pursuing so that you in fact remain happy. So we're going to look at a few different versions of happiness. Um, and again, this is just this slide is just how it relates to marriage. Uh, the answer we give to the question of happiness is going to have a big influence on the kind of marriage we pursue, right? If happiness is just uh, contained in material things, then we're going to pursue a marriage in that material way, whether that's just through uh, you know an increased emphasis on the sexual relationships uh, or sexual aspects of marriage, or maybe the status uh, parts of marriage. I want to marry to this family or this social class, right? Or it will focus on the social setting of my entire married life, right? Like that I'm living in this particular neighborhood. My kids go to this particular school. I drive this kind of car. And so we're, we're concerned about that rather than the foundations of marriage, which should be, you know, love and goodwill towards the spouse. Okay. Okay, so really quickly, uh, you probably remember this, uh, Walter Spitzer's levels of happiness, level one happiness, level two happiness. And so we'll go through these first three, then we'll take a break uh, from the video, and then we'll come back to the second video. Uh, the lens by which we're going to look through the uh, ways of happiness is our boy uh, Lil Wayne because he, in different parts of his life, has exhibited uh, these levels of happiness. So the first one is the hedonist level, the idea that you know, you're know you just mostly focused on the physical dimensions of happiness. And so if you were to only pursue this, you would be uh, in this level, you're stuck in level one. This is when we say you're you're the hedonist in this in this case. So you have a overly concerned focus on food, uh, drink, uh, sex, the physical pleasures. Now, you know, big asterisk right off the bat, these are not bad things. In fact, like they're good things. Maybe you know, it depends on what the drug is, but for the most part, they're good things. The problem is that if you think these are the only good things and you stay at this level, that's when it becomes a problem, right? So it's not saying that you can't enjoy uh, your food. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy the things of this world. It just means that you, ha you can't stop there, right? You've got to keep going. Luckily for us, uh, Lil Wayne does, in fact, keep going 
Uh, this is uh, Lil Wayne and Fat Joe's Make It Rain uh, from way back when. And there is a different type of happiness, level two, that comes from, you know, you say accomplishments, achievements. And you know this, right, if you've, if you've won a championship, right? You, you win the state championship in soccer or swimming, and there's this great joy that comes from winning the championship. You know you put in the hard work, you won the award, and there's a great joy. You also know if that you've been in that situation that it doesn't last, right? That that happiness eventually fades. And so what happens is that if you stay in this level, you're constantly pursuing, you're constantly trying to find that happiness that's ultimately fleeting, right? And so like if, you've, if you had the happiness from winning the championship, you got to win another one because it's not going to last. And so what happens if you're stuck in this level, the egoist level, is that you're always trying to pursue these zero-sum things, right? Like money and fame, popularity, these are zero-sum games. If, if you have more money, that means someone else has less money. And that competitive advantage can lead to really unhappiness in the end. You see this all the time in celebrity life. People have all the fame and money in the world, and you think, how could they not be happy? And then you look at the number of celebrities whose marriages crumble. They get divorced. There's cheating scandals. The number of celebrities that ultimately, you know, sadly, commit suicide. Right? Robin Williams is another you know, famous example that recently happened. And you kind of wonder, well, they had everything. Why weren't they happy? And there's something here right? that if you were to stay in these two levels, there's something missing in your life, right? And so what Spitzer says is, again, this is not, he is a priest, right? But it's not necessarily a religious argument. The idea is that this is a very human experience. Uh, C.S. Lewis says the reason we're so focused on this level one is that these are the life forces, right? That, you know, without food, drink, and sex, you know, life will not continue. And so there's, there's a natural pull and draw to that. But if we stay at that, then we're subhuman, right? We're staying in just that animal level. The egoist part kind of brings into it the subversion of what is properly human. Like, I don't think that there's many animals out there that are concerned with fame, acquiring wealth, and things like that, and their popularity. But humans are. And if you stay at that level, though, there's something weird at being, like, not robotic, but almost, like, too, not too human. That Like, there's more to life than just fame, money, popularity, right? And so when you have an imbalance on either of those two things, you know, that unhappiness starts to creep in. So what do they say? The level three, altruism. This is a picture here of Lil Wayne after he donated uh, a bunch of money to uh, the park that he grew up near uh, after Katrina. And um, coincidentally, there's another park right near his, his rival playground. He did not give money to that one. So maybe it's not true altruism, but hey, he at least helped out the community. He recently, not recently, but a couple years back, built a skate park. I think it's since been defunct, but it's some community center now. Um, and you guys know this from your service trips, that giving and serving others actually brings this deep happiness within you that's very different than egoism and hedonism, right? And uh, I sit in the office with Mr. Murphy, and you know we talk sometimes about y'all's service reflections and your essays, and the amount of times someone's written something like this, you know, at the end of the day, I realized I, I got more out of it than I gave. Like, we painted her house, but like, she painted my heart. You know, something cheesy like that, right? Like, that uh, at the end of the day, when I did my service, I thought I was helping them, but they really helped me. Now, that's a good insight to have. In fact, that's a very human insight to have that there's some kind of joy that's associated with serving and helping others. That's a good and normal thing. Now, if you then fall back into the first two, right, hedonism or egoism, and think that the only thing is your service, as if you're the center of that uh, action, well, then that's when you fall back into uh, level two and stay there. What Spitzer is trying to say here is that in level three, you actually take on the most human role, is that uh, what it is, what kind of creature you are, and we talked about this with, with screw tape, is you're the type of creature that is meant to be other centered, that you're focused outwardly. Right? And we're going to talk about how that applies specifically to being a good husband and a good father down the road. That when the father's gaze is outwardly focused, his true identity is actually revealed to him. That if you stay insular, like you're never actually going to be the best father or husband that you can be. So, level three happiness, loving, serving others, actually brings this lasting joy uh, that is different than these first two. We're going to pause it here, um, and then we'll pick it up in the next video about the fourth level, which is going to add a little bit to altruism.
Um, what I want you to do right now, though, and you know, in your notebook, sheet of paper, is write down, you know, again, to yourself, I don't need to necessarily know, which level you think you're at right now, level one, two, or three. And the reason I want you to start thinking in this way is that you, know, you don't want to have this false version of yourself, like, oh, yeah, I'm really altruistic when you're really stuck in level two, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really a caring, loving guy, but you're really focused on level one. And you might fluctuate, right? Like, you might find, like, right now you're in level one, and sometimes you're not, sometimes you're in three. Lent is a great time to start reflecting on these things. Where, where do you find yourself on this scale? Uh, it doesn't mean you're necessarily an evil person if every now and then you're focused on this one. It just means you've got to you know, be aware of that and get back to a higher level of happiness. Okay? So write down on a sheet of paper where you think you are, and then I'll see you in the next one.